Customer pilots directed almost 3,000 precision strikes last year. We're super proud of it. It allows you to separate the bad guys from the good. It's a big deal. But we have something much bigger. Your kids probably have one of these, right? Not quite. Hell of a pilot? No. That skill is all AI. It's flying itself. Its processor can react a hundred times faster than a human. The stochastic motion is an anti-sniper feature. Just like any mobile device these days, it has cameras and sensors, and just like your phones and social media apps, it does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shaped explosive. This is how it works. Did you see that? That little bang is enough to penetrate the skull and destroy the contents. They used to say guns don't kill people. People do. Well, people don't. They get emotional, disobey orders, aim high. Let's watch the weapons make the decisions. Now, trust me, these were all bad guys. Now that is an airstrike of surgical precision. It's one of a range of products. Trained as a team, they can penetrate buildings, cars, trains, evade people, bullets, pretty much any countermeasure. They cannot be stopped. Now, I said this was big. Why? Because we are thinking big. Watch. A $25 million order now buys this. Enough to kill half a city, the bad half. Nuclear is obsolete. Take out your entire enemy, virtually risk-free. Just characterize him, release the swarm, and rest easy. These are available today. We have a distribution network taking orders from military, law enforcement, and specialist clients. Dumb weapons drop where you point them. Smart weapons consume data. When you can find your enemy using data, even by a hashtag, you can target an evil ideology right where it starts. This short film is more than just speculation. It shows the results of integrating and miniaturizing technologies that we already have. I'm Stuart Russell, a professor of computer science at Berkeley. I've worked in AI for more than 35 years. Its potential to benefit humanity is enormous, even in defense. But allowing machines to choose to kill humans will be devastating to our security and freedom. Thousands of my fellow researchers agree. We have an opportunity to prevent the future you just saw, but the window to act is closing fast. During a commencement speech on Thursday, President Obama defended his foreign policy, including target assassinations and drone warfare. Obama made the remarks at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. As Commander-in-Chief, I have not hesitated to use force unilaterally where necessary to protect the American people. Thanks to our military, intelligence, and counterterrorism professionals, bin Laden is gone. Anwar Alaki, a leader of the al-Qaeda affiliate in Yemen, is gone. Ahmed Abdi Ghodani, the al-Qaeda leader in Somalia, he's gone. Ahmed Abu Qatala, accused in the attacks in Benghazi, captured. Mohammed Mansour, the leader of the Taliban, gone. Leader after leader in ISIL. Haji Mutas, their number two. Mohammed 
Emwazi, who brutally murdered Americans, Abu Nabil, the ISIL leader in Libya, all gone, Abu Dawood, a leader of their chemical weapons program, captured. The list goes on, because if you target Americans, we will find you, and justice will be done, and we will defend our nation. That was President Obama delivering the commencement speech at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs on Thursday. With only a small number of U.S. special forces on the ground, Iraq and Syria have become new fronts in the global drone war that has launched thousands of strikes in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen and Somalia. The exact number of civilians killed by drones is unknown because the program operates in secret. We turn now to an unlikely voice challenging the drone warfare program, former U.S. Army Reserve Chaplain Chris Antal, who recently resigned his post in protest. In April, Reverend Antal wrote a letter to President Obama detailing his reasons for leaving the U.S. Army Reserves, citing his opposition to the administration's use of drone strikes, its policy on nuclear proliferation and what he calls the executive branch's claim of extra-constitutional authority and impunity for international law." Unquote. This is not the first time Reverend Antal has voiced his concerns. In 2012, he delivered a sermon in Afghanistan and anonymously posted the text on a Unitarian Universalist website. At the time, he identified himself only as an army chaplain in Afghanistan. The sermon read in part, quote, We have sanitized killing and condoned extrajudicial assassinations, war made easy without due process, protecting ourselves from the human cost of war. We have deceived ourselves, denying the colossal misery our wars inflict on the innocent. Reverend Antal's superiors discovered the sermon, and he was reprimanded, nearly losing his job. Then, mid-April, he decided to voluntarily resign over his continued concerns about drone warfare. In doing so, Reverend Antal forfeits benefits that otherwise would have accrued to him through his eight years of service in the U.S. Army Reserve. Reverend Chris Antal joins us now in our New York studio. He is a minister for the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Rock Tavern, New York, and a founder of the Hudson Valley New York Chapter of Veterans for Peace. Reverend Chris Antal, welcome to Democracy Now! Amy, thank you. I'm glad to be here. You're still in the Army, is that right? I'm on my way out, but the paperwork uh, hasn't uh, been completed yet. But you have resigned. I've submitted my resignation, but the Army is a big bureaucracy, and it takes time to get all the signatures. So, really, you're still a U.S. Army chaplain? I am. Uh, I can't speak from that capacity on this program, but uh, on paper, yes. So, talk about your decision. How long did you serve as an Army chaplain, and where did you serve? Sure. I uh, served for five years, uh, eight years in the Reserve, five years uh, as a chaplain. And uh, most of that time was as a Reserve uh, chaplain. I did spend about two years on active duty and altogether uh, about six months in Afghanistan. And <clears throat> talk about your decision to leave. Sure. Well, uh, before I can talk about my decision to leave, I need to say why I got in in the first place. Uh, as a minister, I was driven by compassion to care for the wounded, and as a citizen, driven by a sense of civic duty to carry my fair share in uh, our nation's wars. Uh, I think I did both of those things during my time in service but eventually began to feel a role conflict between uh, my role as a military officer and my role as an ordained minister. And I couldn't reconcile that role conflict, uh, so I decided to resign. Talk about the speech I just quoted from. Where did you give that speech? Sure. Well, it was a sermon, and uh, it was never anonymous. As you said, when I posted it, I identified myself. Uh, I gave that sermon on Veterans Day, which was on a Sunday in 2012 at Kandahar Airfield to a gathered uh, a community gathered for worship in my tradition, a Unitarian Universalist service. And uh, that was about six weeks into my deployment uh, when I had witnessed uh, drones. I had uh, learned about uh, practices that violate my sense of what is right. 
And I decided it was my prerogative as a religious leader to address that in the context of a religious service, a forum of lamentation, uh, a confession. Uh, and um, that is uh, what I did in my sermon. And because I think the issues I raise are of concern for a larger audience, for the whole nation, I made that available through a church website um, that uh, is sponsored by my denomination. And talk about what happened then. How was it discovered, and what was the response by the military? Well, two days after it appeared online, I was contacted by an Army lawyer who had read the post. He forwarded it to my commander. I was summoned to the commander's office. Uh, he told me uh, th that my message doesn't support the mission. Uh, he told me uh, that I make us look like the bad guys. Um, he asked me to take it down, uh, which I did, um, and immediately. Uh, nevertheless, I was uh, uh, subjected to an investigation. It's called an Article 15.6 investigation. I had to get a trial defense lawyer in Afghanistan uh, that was provided to me by the Army. Uh, and uh, that process drew out for about two months. And it ended with uh, what's called a general officer memorandum of reprimand. I was handed uh, an official reprimand uh, that said I had uh, made politically inflammatory statements. Uh, and uh, I was, on that basis, released from active duty in Afghanistan, uh, sent home with a do not promote evaluation, which uh, is really a career killer in the military. You quit in a very public way with a letter to President Obama, your letter of resignation. And in it, you said, I resign because I refuse to serve as an empire chaplain. Explain. Well, sure. Uh, for me, democracy is about checks and balances. Uh, democracy is about due process. Uh, these drone wars have blown due process uh, up in smoke. Uh, they've blown checks and balances up in smoke. Uh, and democracy is also about uh, no establishment and free exercise of religion. Uh, we have in our nation uh, an established religion. It's not Christianity. Jeremy Gunn calls it American national religion. Uh, it has uh, consists of the unholy trinity of uh, governmental theism, uh, military supremacy, and an understanding of capitalism as freedom. And uh, as a religious leader, uh, I feel it's my prerogative to differentiate myself from this state-sanctioned religion and speak uh, from my authentic tradition in a way that resists uh, these national policies. Uh, and uh, that's what I've done in offering my resignation uh, and s stating quite clearly that I will not serve as an empire chaplain. I will not lend religious legitimacy to this state-sanctioned violence. Have you received a response from President Obama since that's who you wrote your resignation letter to? I have not. You also have become a shareholder of Honeywell? I am a shareholder of Honeywell, yes. Is this how you plan to support yourself now? Uh, well, I've never been a shareholder before of anything, and I only own one share. And uh, the reason why I became a shareholder is uh, because I was uh, frustrated with uh, the lack of progress through legislative advocacy. And I believe what we are facing in our country is not just a military-industrial complex that Eisenhower wrote about. It's a military-industrial-congressional complex. And we cannot uh, do sh legislative advocacy without doing shareholder advocacy and confronting some of the corporations that are profiting and that are lobbying our elected officials in order to influence um, the militarization of U.S. foreign policy. Mm. Um, can you talk about attending the Honeywell shareholders meeting and what you did? Sure. I've been to two shareholder meetings now, uh, the first one in 2015, uh, where I addressed uh, the CEO, David Cody, on their profiting from armed drones proliferation. Uh, this year, uh, I went, as I did last year, with my uh, fellow veteran, Nick Motern, and he addressed uh, the drone 
profiting, and I chose to address uh, Honeywell's uh, profiting from nuclear weapons. Uh, so I asked uh, Mr. Cody how much Honeywell is profiting from the uh, administration's investment of uh, trillions of dollars in the modernization of our nuclear arsenal. I asked him how much Honeywell is profiting from the administration's uh, decision to launch uh, a new airdropped nuclear cruise missile. And I asked uh, Mr. Cody if he'd ever been to Hiroshima, because I've been there twice, and uh, whether he uh, had faced the horror uh, that this technology produces. Your wife of 18 years is Japanese? Yes, I've been married 18 years, and we have five children. And what was your response to President Obama just last week going to Hiroshima? Well, I was glad and proud of our president for visiting Hiroshima. Uh, however, I am disappointed that, uh, although he talks the talk of nuclear abolition, the actions of his administration uh, are not consistent with what he's saying. Um, I agree that Hiroshima calls for a moral revolution, a revolution uh, of consciousness and an awakening of America. And I hope, and I remain hopeful, that the administration will cancel plans for the new airdrop nuclear cruise missile and take uh, the 1,000 nuclear warheads off uh, launch on warning status. Um, Reverend Chris Antal, can you talk about how those you've ministered to have responded to your resignation? Who did you serve in Afghanistan? Well, I uh, served as an Army chaplain. And as an Army chaplain, I'm responsible for the soldiers in my assigned unit, but also uh, soldiers in my area of operations, as well as contractors and uh, service members from all branches. And I served all of those people uh, during my deployment to Afghanistan. Uh, I can say that when I preached the sermon uh, that led to my reprimand, uh, I had the full support of the community of faith that attended that service. Uh, when I appealed the letter of reprimand, I appealed with more than 30 letters of support from everyone in that congregation, as well as concerned clergy, chaplains, and citizens across America. Uh, so I have had uh, a lot of support. I wanted to get your response to uh, this presidential election. I want to turn to yeah. Democratic presidential candidate, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. In 2014, The Guardian columnist Owen Jones questioned her about the use of drone warfare. You're a loving parent. What would you say to the loving parents of up to 202 children who have been killed by drones in Pakistan in a program which you escalated? as Secretary of State? Well, I would argue with the premise, um, because clearly uh, the uh, efforts that were made by the United States in cooperation with our allies in Afghanistan and certainly with the Afghan government to prevent the threat that was in Pakistan from crossing the border, killing Afghans, killing Americans, Brits and others, uh, was aimed at uh, targets that had uh, been identified and were considered to be threats. Mm. Uh, the numbers about um, potential civilian casualties, I, I take with a, uh, a somewhat big grain of salt, because there has been other studies which have proven there not to have been uh, the number of civilian casualties. And last October, on NBC's Meet the Press, Chuck Todd asked Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders about his position on drones. What does counterterrorism look like in a Sanders administration? Drones, special forces, or, or, or what does it look like? Well, all of that and more. Uh, you, you would, you're okay with the drone? Look, using drone is a, a weapon. When it works badly, it is terrible and it is counterproductive. When you blow up a facility or a building which kills women and children, sure. you know what? It, not only does it do us, it's terrible. But it's, you're comfortable with the idea of using drones if well, you think you've isolated yes. a, an important terrorist? Yes. yes. So that, yes. that continues. Yes. And look, look, we all know, you know, that there are people as of this moment plotting against the United States. We have got to be vigorous in protecting uh, our country, no question about that. That's right. Senator Bernie Sanders and mm. before that, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Yeah, what they're not saying is uh, the numbers and the Bureau of Investigative 
Journalism released just two days ago that there have been 7,142 people killed with U.S. drone strikes, most of those in Pakistan. Now, my question is, where is the necessity, where is the imminent threat to my family, to our families here in the United States, when we kill people halfway around the world with a drone strike?